Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to, for me to be here and also honor to be here. You have already said everything what I wanted to <laughs> wanted to. Yes, uh, I'm the CEO of Social Impact. We, uh, we, under, we, have, we are an agency for social innovation. We exist since 20 years and uh, in this last 20 years we have developed some social innovations uh, in, in Germany. For example, uh, as mentioned, just the first car sharing system uh, in the world. <laughs> Uh, also the German microfinance system. We have developed uh, the, uh, a specific uh, business support system for disadva disadvantaged people. And for all this, what we have done in the last uh, last 20 years, I got these awards like you have, like you have mentioned, uh, mentioned before. Uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we are convinced that uh, we will only survive if we will change the world to a better. But I'm, but I'm not a politician, uh, so I'm also not a revolutionary. So I'm an economist. So I do what I can, what I really can best. Uh, what I really can best is to support people to build up a business. But we are not uh, focused on an ordinary business. We are focused on social business or social entrepreneurship models. Uh, so the, we started with this idea to, to, to specify on social entrepreneurs, on social startups almost three, three years ago. So first, uh, what we have done in this time was to build up a social impact lab. The social impact lab is a space, a big space usually, uh, where we offer space where social entrepreneurs can meet each other or social startups can meet each other where they can uh, discuss with, with each other where they can, where they have the chance to meet uh, decision makers from the poli uh, politics and uh, business partners. And also we offer in the social impact lab, we offer seminars, workshops, and uh, some more. That was the first point, the social impact lab in 2011 in, uh, in Berlin. Uh, but uh, we realize that it's not enough to only to, re to, to offer a physical space for social entrepreneurs, so that uh, we realize that social entrepreneurs or social startups need much more support, and so we developed, uh, we, we de developed a specific accelerator program for social startups. So startups are people who have an idea to solve a social problem in a sustainable way, in an entrepreneurial, in an entrepreneurial way. So we offer the social startups, this potential social startups, co a free co-working space. We offer some coaching, business advice, uh, mentoring, specific seminars and workshops and so on. Uh, and then we realized if they have all this, they get all the support, the biggest problem is to get an access to finance. And so we developed a specific finance program uh, for, the, for the social startups. The specific finance program based on two different programs. One is the first crowdfunding platform, I think, in Germany for social startups. We have developed and we started this platform, uh, I think, six months ago, and we already raised more than 700,000 euros on this platform. And also we have developed a specific investment readiness program for social, social startups. This is also the first one uh, in, uh, in Germany. Uh, uh, also, we have developed in the last three years uh, an, online, an online learning platform called Social Impact Net for all these people who have not, we don't have a chance to take part in the Social Impact Lab because they are not located in a specific place. Uh, so, so we offer them this, uh, this option, this opportunity to, to work on the online, in online uh, circumstances. The best of all is that everything what we offer is free for our participants, it costs nothing. Um, we started with this idea in 2011, like I have mentioned before in Berlin. Now we have uh, seven social impact labs, we have seven uh, accelerator programs in, in six places, in six different cities in Germany, and also in, uh, in Austria and in Switzerland. Um, Already, we have already created more than 100 social uh, social business. Um, our startups. That's maybe it's maybe how how uh, good this program is. Our startups got more than 17 national and international uh, national and international awards. Um, 
We have also, in our, our social impact labs, we have also created social business for the global south and for, uh, for Africa. It's not only based for, not only solutions for Germany. Uh, the people who are come to us are free uh, with their ideas, and if they have a good idea for Africa or for the global south, we also support this. For example, uh, one of our startup called Ahadu, he has developed a specific app, learning app, for Ethiopia. This, uh, App is based on the curricula, on the Ethiopian uh, curricula, and uh, he offer mathematics in English, uh, and this work very close together with the ministry in Ethiopia uh, to to make this uh, possible in Ethiopia. So we have we had another we have another one called More Than Shelters. It's a specific. There are specific shelters for refugees. Uh, for all over the world, but uh, the first pilot project is now based in Syria. We got some money from uh, from our crowdfunding platform to to uh, pay for this uh, for the specific shelters, and now we have some hundred shelters uh, in Syria uh, with this project. Uh, with this project, more than more than shelters. Uh, so we have another one is uh, .hiv. That's a project uh, uh, we have developed um, this year, last year. Because this year you could get uh, you get, uh, could uh, apply for the top level domains. Uh, they applied for the top level domain .hiv, and they got it. Uh, it's, they have to apply it in, in New York uh, for this one. They got it. The only one in in the world. And now they sell this top level domain .hiv, and all the income goes to HIV projects in the world. So we have some more in uh, for Africa and also for for the glo for the global south. It's very open. To make this happen, uh, we have very we have strong. Oh no, maybe one one point more. Actually, we are running uh, a social impact award in Eastern Europe. Uh, very successfully, we have we have more than 150 applicants, but we can offer only 10 uh, uh, 10 stipendiums for uh, people from Easter from Eastern Europe. Um, the opportunity is that they could get to come to, to, to Berlin for six weeks and they get also 5,000 euros uh, for the living cost. So we are spreading out with this idea, this uh, idea of social and social impact lab and social impact start program, we, like we call it, is already best practice on the European, on the European level. Uh, to make this uh, happen um, is uh, because of our very engaged cooperation work with corporate partners. We don't get public money for this. We have big corporate partners, and maybe that's a link to our discussion now. We have uh, some big German or international companies where we work together. We have de de developed together a CSR strategy for them, like SIP or uh, the German Bank, Deutsche Bank, Telefonica, JP Morgan Chase Foundation, Drossos, and others who uh, work very close together to make, to make this work uh, happen, to make this work uh, pro uh, possible. So and now we have also the first interest partners from, uh, from Africa. We will have the first meeting with uh, potential partners from uh, Casablanca uh, in, uh, in three weeks uh, here in Germany. So it's getting more and more interesting to, to uh, uh, yeah, more interesting for, for a lot of people, for a lot of organizations to make social entrepreneurship happen all over the world. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this uh, kind introduction and also for the invitation to this uh, event and I'm very happy to be here um, and I just uh, wanted to give you a brief overview over what we are, who we are and what we do and um, also give some um, content on transport uh, related to sustainable mobility as this is wasn't uh, yet in the last three days uh, uh, a topic as far as I could see. So um, we are uh, based in Hamburg and uh, he is part of our team, uh, internationally um, related uh, people. Also we work together with uh, the York University and with uh, Swiss, uh, uh, Swiss professionals and so on. And our uh, main aim is enabling all people to have equal access to opportunities and um, um, therefore we want to help countries, cities and community 
to develop a good uh, transport governance and um, achieve uh, um, a transport system reform to reduce transport needs um, and uh, have a better life uh, anyway. And um, uh, the transport needs which uh, can't be reduced uh, should be shifted to more sustainable modes and um, also the system efficiency can be improved in all to make it more sustainable. So uh, we work in different uh, areas. We, we do really uh, project assistance in uh, different uh, countries. We uh, also improve the transport research. I will come back later on that. And uh, also doing study tours uh, because we know that uh, it's sometimes helpful for um, uh, experts to see what happens in other countries, to see best practice examples and see that uh, good transport projects work in some other areas. Uh, here, one picture you can see like a, a, a study tour to Transmilenio to the BRT in uh, Latin America, BRT, I will speak on that later. And we're doing uh, summer schools, lectures, trainings on sustainable transport in Germany, but also uh, worldwide, especially. Um, healthcare and mobility projects, so uh, often uh, healthcare is, uh, is a problem of mobility. So we try to uh, improve the mobility of uh, healthcare workers and also um, I will come back on that later on again. And then dissemination of best practice projects so that people get to know about uh, good ideas in other areas of the world. I can see this often here in Germany. Uh, many people uh, only speak German and uh, so they read only German and then they only get to know things which are published in uh, German language and vice versa. English, uh, English publications didn't know about uh, German projects and so on and uh, in Germany nobody knows about good practice, best practice in African cities and vice versa. So we work together with uh, international partners uh, in Germany and worldwide, uh, different uh, consultancies and other NGOs like we are, but also international uh, um, uh, organizations like uh, the UNEP or UN Habitat. And so now I would like to come shortly give some insight into mobility, transport, traffic, accessibility. Uh, here uh, we can see a nice picture, f I think it's from India. Mainly it's a very sustainable uh, transport. We have public transport on the one side, then we have non-motorized transport, rickshaw, which is very nice uh, for the environment and also as an uh, uh, employment factor. Um, we have um, nearly no private cars, I think, uh, at the moment, but this is something which is changing and um, which uh, causes more and more problems worldwide. And um, if we talk about uh, traffic, then it's uh, the thing between uh, the, 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 the cars or the, the vehicles, the mobiles and the infrastructure. If it's about mobility, then it's like the, the question between uh, how can things and people transport it between uh, infrastructure and the transport is done with vehicles and persons and goods are transported and they cause then traffic. But that's all to have mobility. And the question is how to get uh, good mobility for uh, with less traffic, so um, with more sustainable traffic. And all in all, it's all about accessibility, access, the ability to reach desired goods, services, activities, and destinations 
nobody really wants to sit uh, in a tr vehicle, uh, but it's because you want to get somewhere and if you can get it uh, nearer to the place where you live or where you are, then uh, you have the same accessibility, but you have less traffic. And therefore, this uh, relates to less um, also uh, environmental impact. Yeah, so access is the ultimate goal of transportation. Um, and um, Finally, we can say that uh, related to, to the Brundtland uh, Commission definition of sustainable development, uh, we have to transfer it to sustainable transport. But here, like sustainable development is the development uh, that meets the need of the present without compromising the ability of the future generations to meet their own needs. So this leads to the following definition by Rieplogel and Littmann. Um, that sustainable transport enables access to goods and services that support equitable development while limiting short and long-term adverse consequences for environmental, social and economic services and systems. So transport is one of a key pillar of the economy, which is also part of uh, sustainability, but unsustainable transport increasingly becomes also a limiting factor for socioeconomic development. Uh, many of us uh, uh, have uh, experiences with it, and um, it can be, um, and on the other side, transport plays also a key role in poverty reduction and uh, inclusive growth. So the accessibility to affordable, affordable transport provides poor people um, with increased access to economic opportunities and services, and that's one uh, possibility to develop uh, people. So it's all about transport, and the question is how uh, uh, everybody gets uh, transport. Is it if you develop uh, uh, streets, uh, if you build uh, more streets, if you build highways? Um, we have one nice example from one of our projects in Africa where we uh, looked at the uh, question who finances um, a transport uh, in uh, transport projects in Africa. So we were uh, seeing this nice um, uh, video from the Kenya Thika superhighway. There they, uh, the African Development Bank says, if you build it, they will come and they talk about uh, the cars and uh, that's one thing we uh, know from scientific, uh, uh, scientific uh, research, that if you build uh, roads, you get more cars, but uh, you don't solve any problem with it, and it's not uh, the sustainable way to uh, solve your transport problems, but you, get, you have more traffic, but uh, it's nothing about more accessibility, especially for the poor people. Mm -hmm. Uh, who are dependent on other ways of trans other modes of transport and not of uh, their own car. Even in Berlin, uh, fifty percent of all, more than fifty percent of all households don't have a car. So uh, it is important to um, really have transport opportunities for all and to make it for all better. So uh, if we look at the human costs of road transports. Uh, then we see um, um, that uh, it's uh, two to five percent of the GDP um, is uh, lost by uh, um, uh, road congestions. Um, uh, we have we have diseases from air pollution, uh, vehicle related ones that lead to half a million uh, premature deaths. Uh, we have road accident fatalities. Uh, which also leads to uh, injuries and uh, loss of uh, gross domestic, domestic project. And uh, finally, also noise is a major uh, cause also of heart diseases and uh, others. So if you look on the um, uh, global landscape, uh, global map on road traffic mortality rates, 
uh, we see that African, uh, uh, the African continent is uh, on the uh, red area, which means uh, very high fatalities per 100,000 population. Um, and uh, so this is one uh, area to work on. So the three pillars of sustainable transport can be seen as a safe and environmental sustainability in, in transport. This means um, good air quality, uh, good emission factors, um, air pollution related diseases should be uh, monitored, accident and safety data is needed uh, to work on this uh, area. Uh, social sustainability, equity, uh, you should uh, look at the travel times, how much time do the people need to have access uh, related to uh, gender, social class and uh, housing location, but also crimes and incidents in transport, one major uh, uh, reason why people don't want to use transit, why they want to use uh, uh, their own transport. And then finally, how much of your of your household budget do you need uh, for uh, the travel budget? Finally, e economic sustainability. Uh, this is um, the transport uh, costs of uh, your national uh, accounts, but also um, how much is used for fuel. Fuel is mainly imported in many countries, for example, in Germany. And... Um, also the institutional structure, how is your institutional structure of your transport industry. So all in all, we need a, uh, also governance sustainability. This is like the, 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 the roof of the three pillars. Okay, and um, to have a, a potential strategies, we always uh, talk about um, avoid, shift, improve uh, transport and uh, reduce uh, your greenhouse gas emissions, but uh, avoid transport means uh, travel does not take place uh, because uh, you can, uh, the needs can be solved uh, nearer to your, to your place or goods don't have to be transpo transported like uh, digital goods can be transported via internet if you have good uh, infrastructure. Shift uh, is a strategy uh, shift to non-motorized transport to to um, to public transport, shifting from uh, uh, individual cars, which are uh, energy inefficient and harming people by uh, accidents, noise, and uh, space needs, especially in uh, cities where you need uh, the space for people uh, to live and also for, for public transport and non-motorized transport. Finally, um, you can also improve. You can improve your, your public transport system, your, your non-motorized transport system, but then finally you can also can improve the individual car. Um, it's not... Um, yeah, it's not needed to, to use two tons of metal to transport a person of 80 kilos. Um, or, or so that's very inefficient. Um, and um, yeah, change the motor system and so on. But this improving is one area where most of the car industry uh, at the moment uh, looks at. They don't look at uh, improving and avoiding, uh, shifting and avoiding but still they don't want to change the system. And so uh, we have to uh, look at avoid and shift. And that's uh, one of our aims at the Institute for Sustainable Transport. As you can see, high efficiency of buses, nice picture here. You see like the same amount of people uh, like on the street without any car with buses, uh, you need three buses and uh, or you need the, the whole street. And uh, so no place for children to play, no place for bicycles to drive. 
Okay, uh, BRT, uh, I was uh, talking about it. It's one uh, interesting area where we think this is best practice, bus rapid transit. You have one corridor for uh, buses and uh, it's very efficient. You have, um, you can uh, very fast uh, transport huge amounts of people and uh, have your own road and uh, it's very very uh, easy to plan and um, much faster to construct um, here two examples be because the car industry always wants to uh, uh, look at metro systems and uh, because then you have more space for cars on, on the uh, zero level but uh, if you look on the costs then you see that BRT is much cheaper per kilometer you uh, only have one to 10 million uh, US dollars per kilometer uh, BRT, but metros cost you a lot more. Uh, we have this discussion also in Hamburg. Uh, it's the uh, same discussion worldwide, but uh, people love to build metros, but it, the construction time is also much longer uh, than with BRTs. Um, same. Uh, if you see it here, like if you have an amount of money, the same costs for uh, this small part of uh, um, metro system, or you can um, cover the whole uh, uh, city with a network of bus rapid transit with the same costs, so uh, it's much more efficient. Uh, another interesting aspect, which is more and more uh, in the discussion, are uh, urban cable cars. They um, are uh, a possibility not only for uh, skiing, but also for urban metropolitans. And um, um, they uh, are very efficient. You can also very fast um, implement them and um, you have a, uh, a steady system of always uh, moving people and um, it's very easy you don't need uh, uh, um, you don't need much space you you can easily uh, go over barriers uh, mountains or rivers or other high density regions where uh, people live so low space requirements uh, you have a high capacity, uh, you can use uh, uh, electricity um, instead of fuel and um, it's a very interesting system which is long time used in Algeria for example but also in uh, Latin America and now it's more and more uh, uh, in the discussion worldwide. Yeah. Our main uh, projects in Africa, the last uh, uh, slide, um, also um, on uh, slightly relating to CSR. Uh, we make an international symposium here in Berlin uh, on the 6th of October together with, with the, the uh, Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, especially for African embassies, uh, which will be invited by us um, and the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. Um, on sustainable transport in Africa and uh, we hope to, to foster the discussion on that topic. Um, and uh, currently uh, Eurist is uh, engaged in BRT in African cities, Kampala, Nairobi, Addis Ababa uh, and um, we're also talking about cable car network in Kampala and other cities in Uganda in other African cities. Uh, we did uh, non-motorized transport improvement in uh, Gaborone and uh, we're working on an EU project uh, improving the um, African uh, transport research in African universities. In six African universities um, test network was it. And uh, also our Make a Move project is about uh, healthcare and um, currently we talk about um, uh, with Volkswagen, with the workers union of Volkswagen on a CSR project in Port Elizabeth to improving the mobility with bicycles. Um, uh, 
this is just upcoming and I just brought some um, uh, literature or some leaflets uh, with me uh, which are just uh, downstairs below the below the the stairs yeah so that's a brief introduction to our work and some content on uh, what transport is about thank you very much All right, thank you very much, both of you, for those talks. Um, we'll come back, but I want to engage the two gentlemen to my left here. They've uh, been patient, and I want to kind of maybe take it back, rewind a little bit, and think about what we really mean by corporate social responsibility. And I hope to hear something about this. And I'll just ask, frame the question um, around development. So development used to be considered uh, the state's responsibility. This is in, in orthodox development thinking in India, in China, uh, in developmental states uh, uh, after colonialism in Africa. Um, and I guess that's changed a bit since the 1980s and we see uh, a kind of disruption in the state uh, corporate sector relationship and there are new roles envisioned for the private sector. But I would like to ask you, what is the role of the state and can you talk about corporate social responsibility with regard to the role of the state? Thank you, Prof. State's role in the 21st century is only to govern and possibly to maintain security of the state. Like you said, from 1980s, as a result of the introduction of what we call Reaganism and Tatarism. That is the introduction of ultra-capitalism in the international system. The issue of development from state is being relegated to the background. State is no more interested in the issue of economic development. And as a result of that, this is being given to the private institutions private companies, in order to determine the forces of supply and demand. So as a result of that, we see so many African countries that continue to remain underdeveloped because the private sectors, they are not ready to embark on economic development. Now going back to the core issue of corporate social responsibility, I find it very difficult to talk about corporate social responsibility because private sector, their target is to make profit as against embarking on humanitarian, uh, I mean humanitarian responsibility in the, society, in, their society, in the society where they find themselves. It is only when it is imposed on them that they try to look into the issue of development in their area of operation. I give so many examples pertaining to this. So what I want to talk about this afternoon is imposed corporate social responsibility. It is not the interest of any private business man or woman to build schools, uh, aid sectors, and possibly to ensure construction of roads. That is not their responsibility. Their responsibility is only to make money. But when the society, where they are getting their profit from, impose it on them, that they continue to look into that. I want to believe that everybody is familiar with the problem of Ogoni crisis in the Niger Delta of Nigeria. The activities of Shell, Chevron, Ajib, Mobile, in the Niger Delta area. It was only after the killing of, the, uh, uh, of Kensa Ruiwa and eight other environmentalists that the concept of corporate social responsibility started to be understood in Nigeria. Not only there, the activities of multinational corporations, there are so many theories. Some liberalists, they will, do, they, they will talk about the, the advantages of having multinational companies in any state. They said they, create, they bring technology, they create jobs, 
the embark on corporate social responsibility. And when we look into their activities, one will begin to appreciate that these institutions are all out for their own profit. Now, from South African perspective, we have so many mining giants in South Africa. But for the purpose of this discussion, I want to look into the, the activities of Anglo-America. Anglo-America, as recent as two years ago, and back on a certain project, everybody knows that HIV AIDS is prevalent in the southern part of Africa. And what Anglo-America did was to supply ARV to those people who are working in the mining sector based on one condition, that after five years, they are going to resign. And when they resign, they give them all the entitlement, if there's anything like that. And after that, they're on their own. Now, looking into the activities of pharmaceutical multinational companies in South Africa, I want to believe that we are aware of what happened during the time of Tabumbeki, when he called for generic ARV. Why the multinational pharmaceutical companies seriously kicked against, against it? Rumor had it that the recall of Tabumbeki back to ANC could not be totally divulged from the activities of multinational corporations. Because they believe that if South Africa should be able to import generic drug or produce it by companies from Brazil, from India, it will affect their profit. And as a result of that, multinational companies, they were not comfortable about this. Then what are we, what are we talking about when we are talking about corporate social responsibility? So another thing that I want to talk about. Maybe we let Mr. Testiohannes respond, and then okay. we'll come back, because we want to get okay. a circle. Uh, OK, yeah. then, OK. Maybe later I will discuss on who benefits from the so-called corporate social responsibility. Thank you. Yeah, great, thank you. <clears throat> thank, thank you very much. I don't really see that I need to talk too much because already the content analysis of social responsibility is done by my colleague over there. Therefore, I will talk only a few words. Uh, number one, soci when we mention social responsibility, it is not only social value, it includes economic value. Both of them usually go together, economic and social value. Secondly, many African countries are very good, or even I can say excellent on papers. They have all regulations. The problem is implementation. There is an implementation problem of social responsibility. Therefore, one very, very important strategy that should be uh, formulated and implemented by African countries is public awareness. They need to teach the public. If the public is well aware of the negative consequences of uh, this uh, lack of social responsibility, then that is enough for the government. So almost 90% of their job is done by the public. The third one I would like uh, to mention is we shouldn't always uh, associate for social responsibility with social good. We need to associate it with economic good also. Because if we don't have economic development or if we don't get profit, we cannot sustain. But we can have economic rationality or economic optimality or economic development while we are aware of culturally, socially, and politically. All these important terms are associated with social responsibility. Therefore, this is what I can say, public education, and countries should be very good in implementation of those nicely put on papers. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to come back to this side. and. Um, I'd like to challenge you both a little bit. Um, I think you, you both presented a scenario in which there's a problem that's defined, and then in some way or another, it's acted upon um, in such a way, hopefully, where you have positive social outcomes, 
and most likely some sort of uh, entrepreneurial, positive entrepreneur, entrepreneurial outcomes, economic growth, as we, we just heard. So I think that's fine, but the, the, the question then is, how are social problems defined? Because it seems to me that the, the definition of the problem will determine the solution. So in, in, in one example, let's take, I mean, you studied uh, mobility in South African cities uh, post-apartheid. Yeah? I mean, at that, at that point, depending who you were, there was a very different problem. If you were living in a township, the problem was you were immobile, you were far from the city, and there weren't very many uh, desirable options. You couldn't really move downtown or around. Meanwhile, if you were in, uh, in a formerly exclusive suburb, to you the problem was, well, folks from the township want to come through my neighborhood, right? And how can we uh, kind of achieve the segregation that we had under apartheid in a democratic system? So that was the problem. So these are two very different problems. And depending on which one you think is the actual problem, you'll have a different solution. It's either uh, improve transportation linkages or um, disconnect. So how is it then that in both of, for both of you, how is it then that you envision problems? <coughs> I don't think that the problem is how, the problem is who. Uh, so, and uh, of course, if you have, if you have two people with different view on the on the social problems, if you are living in a, in a township in Africa and you talk about mobili uh, mobilization, it's a different uh, view. Then I will have this. But if you are developing a social innovation, one of the key aspects is ownership. That means you can't solve a problem without the people who are where you want to solve the problem for them. So we have to do it together with these people from the township, and otherwise it, it doesn't work. So that means social innovation that's not independent from the target group where you want to work with it. So that's who is uh, uh, the one, and ownership is the one, is a, a specific aspect on this. That's my, my point. Another, I'd like to uh, do a comment. It's, um, I think we have to understand that corporate social responsibility is not the same as a donation. That makes really a def uh, difference. You have mentioned it already. Social responsibility is defined uh, uh, that the company does more or do more than they have to do by law for employees or for customers or for the region. That's the definition of corporate social responsibility. Yeah, good question. I mean, uh, currently, most people uh, who are decision makers or journalists, they have to rush from A to B very fast and they define their problem differently to uh, the pregnant women or uh, the elder people who can't cross the road anymore because uh, uh, the cars are driving so fast. So mm, one uh, question is uh, the fight uh, about definition def define the problem yes and i i think the problem is the automobile society and therefore uh, it's a big difficulty i think uh, currently that uh, corporate social responsibility for example in the car industry uh, if they build the cars where they say the customer wants, but actually they brought the customer there to wanting them. Um, they, if they are responsible, they have to change their, their business concept and they have to change their BMWs. Um, and, and they are good in, in corporate social responsibility and BMW is good in... in, in making new traffic concepts and so on. Uh, but as long as the main profit is coming from big cars, which are inefficient because they are congesting the roads and uh, heating up the atmosphere. Um, so we have to f fight for the right problem, yes. Thank you. All right, let's, um, I'll try and tie some of these viewpoints together. Um, we've heard a lot about innovation, whether it be technological, social, in the transport sector, for example. And you mentioned the pharma sector. I think that's a very great example where there has been a lot of innovation, but oftentimes those innovations are kept secret. Um, they're, they're patented and then protected. 
And l I would like to talk a little bit about intellectual property rights and the relationship between the intellectual property rights regime and whether you call it uh, corporate social responsibility, uh, 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 what have you. Um, so for me, uh, uh, maybe I'll just comment briefly on why I bring this up is I think that the role of the state in the 21st century is still to pick winners, but in a very different sense than the way that states used to pick winners in like say the 1960s and 70s. I think the states, states have to pick winners uh, when it comes to firms like Cipla, an Indian pharmaceutical firm that is committed to providing generic, or I don't even know if we should say generic, but cheap antiretroviral medicines to uh, folks with uh, HIV AIDS, and compare that to firms like AstraZeneca, which are steadfastly opposed to the, the provision of uh, cheap ARVs. So to me, it's the state's responsibility to pick CIPLA as a winner, and I think that in many cases, um, the end user, the consumer, is not the person that's dealing with the company. I mean, the state is somehow mediating the relationship between CIPLA and the end user. And so this mediating role of the state is where there is a lot of leeway where it can then pick winners. So um, I'm just curious, what is your take on um, intellectual property rights in the 21st century? And how can they be adapted to be a bit more, um, so that the innovations that you guys are and other people are doing can in fact be put to perhaps better use or maybe broader use, I should say. Thank you very much. The issue of uh, patenting, it was seriously discussed during the Uruge rant, which led to what trade organizations signed in 1995. But there is an opening, most especially for the developing states, despite the fact that during the negotiation period, the developing states, they didn't have the necessary wherewithal to contribute constructively to the final agreement signed because of lack of information and their diplomatic, uh, they, 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 their, their power of, their, uh, of negotiation is very weak. And as a result of that, they were imposed, I mean, they were forced to sign the treaty, which led to the current World Trade Organization. Now, the only loophole that the developing states are using, most especially South Africa, is the concept of trips. And the trips says that in a situation whereby there is a, there's a certain thing that is very, very critical, most especially medicine, that you need to save life of your people. You can go to any length in order to get it. That is the only way, uh, that is the only open way for most of the African states in order to get a generic ARV. Otherwise, the budget of South Africa cannot pay for the real ARV medicine, I mean drugs uh, uh, produced by the multinational corporations that are in active operation in South Africa. And this even led to a court, uh, a court case between South Africa and the multinational corporations. Rec as recently as January 2014, the multinational, they made an attempt in order to, to embark on what I can call a propaganda in order to, di to, to disregard South African position towards ARV. So the implication of that is that these multinationals as much as we are talking about their corporate social responsibility, taking care of their staff, taking care of the environment where they operate, and possibly support the government in power in their own state, there are so many other things that they are doing that is so cloudy to the government that hosts them. I want to believe that we know the power of multinationals. What they've started, what they've been doing as far back as 1973, when the government was a uh, overthrown in Chile. So the multinationals, their activities in the concept of social responsibility, I don't believe that they are doing more, I mean they are doing much in order to promote sustainable development in Africa. Thank you. 
Uh, this is a very important topic. We need to remember the following facts. Knowledge is created and it belongs to the public, to the society. Why? Because there are so many stakeholders in the process of knowledge creation. But those at the forefront should be given, should be given a chance to recover the energy, the intellect, the cost they uh, spent. Then, it, the knowledge should be disseminated to the public for the public good. It is important. That's why in the United States, we always say classified and then declassified to the public. Therefore, of course, the company which developed the patented or the knowledge can work until certain stage. The remaining will be to the public. That's why also there is the same like our life, there is also a life cycle for knowledge. Knowledge is born, developed, matured, declined, and phase away. Therefore, it is a the responsibility of all of us stakeholders to keep the knowledge for the maximum benefit of the public. Now, as my friend already asked us, the role of the state, the role of the society, the role of the corporate world should work hand in hand. As you can see, the German here in Germany, the Germans are almost at the top of the social responsibility and environmental protection. Do you think that they have, they, they are different? No, but already the public is very aware and to collaborate. Therefore, we need to know that to certain extent, knowledge will be protected for the benefit of those who created it. But it, when we see generally, it belongs to the public. Thank you. Oh, yes, um, I'm totally agree. Uh, but like I mentioned before, I'm, I'm not a politician. I think it's a, that's a task of the state to, to fight against the specific laws and to, to, to ensure that uh, people get, could, could use this knowledge that we have developed. In a, but I'm a social entrepreneur, so it means uh, it's not my fight because I'm not working as a politician, but I'm looking for solutions, for other solutions. How can I deal with the situation if you have this intellectual property law? How can you deal with this? Uh, so, and probably you will find, you will find a solution, maybe the solution is not in generic, in generics, the solution is in education. Because if you work with people, and you can do much, probably much more, for example, against HIV, if you uh, invest in, uh, in education than when you invest in generic. So that's a, for an example. Um, because we are, we, are talking about, we are talking about the health service. And when they ask which in innovation was the most important in innovation in the health sector, you can say penicillin, for example. But you also can say it was Florence Nightingale because she was the one who, was, who makes the nurses possible in the, in the hospitals. So that's more, much, more, much more important than probably penicillin. So you can have to change your mind, probably have to change it, and have to look if there is, pop, op, is there another opportunity to deal with this strange situation. The strange situation that we have this law on intellectual property, it's, it's not right that we have this one, but you probably you will find another solution, and another solution is better than, the, than to fight against this law. I agree uh, with my other panelists, and uh, I just uh, also can uh, say that that uh, regulation and state state law uh, governance uh, is important and cannot be um, uh, uh, corporate social responsibility is an add-on for forerunners uh, to change the world or to make the world better. 
but it's uh, not instead of laws and regulations and um, that's important to say. Since uh, it is my area, entrepreneurship, as uh, I gave last uh, yesterday a lecture, we need to see the social entrepreneurship from broader point of view. Uh, when we say social entrepreneur, uh, it's not only that you develop uh, a project, uh, let's say development aid project, doing this, doing that, reducing poverty or uh, battling HIV, it's, no, it's not only that. That is one aspect of it, but we need to define it f from uh, narrow to uh, broad, from shallow to deep, and from static to dynamic. Therefore, if we use and define it and work on it, on social entrepreneurship with these conditions in point, then it will serve us a lot, like what I say, to create social and economic value. Thank you. Can we, I'll let you respond, but uh, I don't think we have too much time left. Let's, if there are any questions, I think it would be nice if we fielded some questions from the audience, um, and then you can either respond to that or the questions, but let's make it a bit more interactive if possible. Well, my take on, on this is that uh, the issue of corporate, responsi uh, corporate social responsibility, I want to believe we should address it the way it's supposed to be addressed so that we'll be able to find a lasting solution to the problem. And I equally want to believe that the essence of this gathering is to look for a way forward in order to benefit the civil society in general. Like I said, on the issue of World Trade Organization, we are talking about patenting, that those people who invent a technology should enjoy it for a certain number of years. But what of those people who steal technology from other people? Are they allowed to enjoy it? I give an example. There's a tea in South Africa which is only produced in the Western Cape Cedarbeck region of Western, uh, the, the, the name of the tea is Roybo's tea. From 1995 until date, several multinational corporations from Europe and America, they were trying to patent this particular product. In 2013, it was a serious case. When a French company was trying to patent it, before the government of the Western Cape kicked against it, they went to court, and in the long run, the, the name was relegated to a generic name that robots can be used by any company, not confined to a certain company. There are so many technology that are still from Africa. For instance, there's a certain plant in Nigeria, we call it bitter leaf. I read it in a book, somebody said that he discovered bitter leaf in Edo State, Bene. This is something that we've been using for hundreds of years in order to address some ailment. But for somebody to come in the 80s and say that he's the one who discovered it. And the implication of it is that if that person is allowed to patent it, it means that you that have it at the back of your, at the back, back of your house, you cannot sell it to say Europe or America, you have to get a license from the person who patented it. So why, why, why are we talking about corporate social responsibility when we know that there are so many things to put in place before we address this one? Thank you. Yeah. Hi, my name is Juliana. Um, I live here in Berlin. Um, one, one remark, I had the feeling between the conversation that a couple of different terms were put in the same box, and I'm just wondering like where people are coming from with their, with their reasoning. So w one part was the corporate social responsibility, uh, which I see more on the multinational um, um, company side and 
their turn in, in like providing to the societies they're, they're working with and like how we can hold them accountable for what they're doing and how they are affecting a society. And then there is social entrepreneurship, whereas I think in that model, um, the, the corporate social responsibility is not just a responsibility, but their identity. So I think this is two different models and where one is like obviously not necessary to really argue about, the other can be targeted from very different angles um, and as well in very different c contexts. And I just found like that, that people came from very different um, backgrounds here. Um, and I, I just wanted to, to, to hear your point of view on, on, on that and probably s some way to, to conclude that and get closer together. I'd Maybe as well from from you as a yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if it's a matter of um, if it's just a matter of semantics that, that different terms are being used for similar things. I would say though that you've probably identified um, these kind of two different types. One where there's a kind of social element that's in the DNA, so to speak of an organization and, and what it does, and another uh, type in which maybe an organization tries to pursue its objectives while kind of building in some sorts of, of, of socially responsible activity. I would say maybe there's more of a fluid connection between them or it's a continuum rather than uh, um, an, an either or, um, but I'm not sure what the panelists would say to that. Yeah. We need to understand that when we talk about social responsibility, it's not only multinational corporations. We need to remember 98% of businesses in Germany are small and medium. Therefore, if 98 of the businesses are small and medium, then they are also responsible for the social value, which is for the uh, social responsibility, therefore we need to define it uh, more broader like what I said, not simply talking about uh, very few multinational corporations very economically very dominant. We need to avoid that when we talk about social responsibility. Every company, not only every company, every individual is responsible. Every individual, every citizen is responsible little by little to contribute. All individual contributions, the summation of all it is towards the betterment of our society. Yes, I agree, but I think uh, it is necessary to clarify it. So uh, I think you have 89% of the German companies are small and medium companies, and a lot of them are really uh, involved in, in the society, and they, they give money, and they spend money, and they donate money to the society, and they feel responsible. But that is not corporate ro social responsibility. Uh, or we also, we have, we have big companies. Uh, I'll make one example. Um, we, have, we, have, we have one big company, the guy is died two weeks ago. His mission was to develop or to sell good products for affordable price. And he died, he was the richest man in Germany. That is not social responsibility. Uh, so, and uh, corporate social responsibility are profit-driven companies who do something more than they have to do by law. That's what I have mentioned before. That's corporate social responsibility. That means like we work together with SAP, one of the biggest technology companies in Germany or in the world, one of the biggest, richest men in this world. It's not necessarily ha he has to work together with us. But he does it or this company does it because they have different reasons to do this. And one reason, they have internal reasons and external reasons. Internal reasons is to make this company more attractive for the employees, for example, to develop human resources strategies, to involve people, employees, in different methodologies outside the company. So they have different internal reasons, but they also have external reasons to make this company more attractive for the society, marketing, and so on, customer uh, reasons. So, that they do it, they don't have to do it, but they do it, 
and they have a benefit from them. So that's corporate social responsibility. A social entrepreneur is not profit driven. A social entrepreneur is mission driven. He his in his priority is to de to develop or to to solve a social problem. The social impact is the driver, not the profit is the driver, and that makes a difference between. Uh, Profit-driven companies and social-driven companies, and that's the difference between corporate social responsibility and social responsibility. Are there any further questions? Yeah, here's one. Well, we'll take both because I saw two hands up. But go ahead. We'll take both, and then whichever comment the or question the panelist wants to answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, my Uh, my name is Mashair. I am from Sudan. Uh, I would like to um, to comment on what Professor Johannes uh, said about the change, about how the thoughts begin and they fade out throughout uh, in a process that ends with them fading out. And I think this is exactly what happened to social responsibility in Sudan uh, in our case. Um, uh, the social responsibility, we have a name for social, social so, uh, responsibility in Sudan. Uh, in our own dialect, it's called nafir. And it was, you know, when, when someone is in need in, in the neighborhood, um, young boys and girls will come to help. This is what we usually call nafir. And in times of floods or flash floods, people help each other without thinking of a return. But then the thing developed. Now social responsibility, for me, for my own definition, from, from where I, I stand, I see social responsibility as a way of those corporates to say sorry for what we, the damage we have done, either environmental damage or whatsoever damage they have done. That's why uh, they, 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 this is their way of saying sorry, okay? And um, in the process of social responsibility, uh, I think it's, it's, it's mutually profitable because uh, those corporates <coughs> come and, uh, for instance, uh, give scholarships, uh, uh, organize festivals, music festivals, um, whatever uh, activity, social responsibility they are in. And it's also, it's like an advertise them, advertisement for them. So it's mutual. They are also gaining profit. So uh, in a way, social responsibility to me, there is a way of, there is a sense of exploitation in this social pro social responsibility definition. Do you agree with me? <laughs> Maybe I'll respond. I think um, I think it's I think we need to move beyond very kind of I would say maybe simplistic notions of say good bad that a corporation that 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 a corporation is inherently evil or or that uh, it, it's necessarily good. I think there are there are both. It's much more complex. I mean, I, I, I gave the example of CIPLA, and you should take a look at what they're doing. I mean, they've made a very uh, a commitment. It's their mission to provide affordable ARVs to people who can't get them any other way. I mean, this is it's hard to say what's what's bad about this. Of course, they have to be profitable, or else they cannot continue that mission. But it seems like their primary objective is this. There are, of course, many other corporations that don't have any type of mission whatsoever like that, and it's just you know profit motive is the main thing. Um, but I think maybe let's take it one step further. And to me, one, one, interesting, um, one in interesting industry is waste management because um, waste is kind of a byproduct of the, the, the urban growth and economic growth that we're seeing. And then there, there are some very interesting questions or very important questions with regard to who is exposed to waste, right? So um, you have in India, about in Delhi, about 200,000 people who go around and collect waste on a daily basis, um, and then they sell it. They sell the recyclable parts. Um, no one is paying them. They're just doing this because they cannot find other work, and they sell the paper, the plastic, the metal, and so on. Now, recently, Delhi, a, a, a private firm, received a subsidy from the Clean Development Mechanism by way of carbon credits to build a waste incinerator. So now this incinerator will incinerate the same exact waste that those people are going around collecting. Now, I think this it, it demonstrates something very interesting. I mean, you've got this... Uh, uh, so now you've got this conflict over waste and there's going to be a loser. It's going to either be these people who are collecting, uh, th these people who are collecting waste or it's going to be this incinerator. You've got social 
questions, that, but you also have environmental questions. And it requires, at some point, someone to prioritize what's more important, social or environmental. And it's, it's much more complex, in my opinion, than simply uh, good versus evil. So I would, I would say uh, I, I, I tend to agree with you that in many cases, I'm, I'm sympathetic to what you said, but we, always, we have to look maybe a little bit deeper and look for some of that complexity. Uh, absolutely, you are right, but when we define, there are two things we need to consider. There are always definitions or when you are talking about certain issue, let's say social entrepreneurship or corporate social responsibilities, there are dimensions we need to consider. There is technical dimension, social dimension, environmental dimension, political dimension, economic dimension, and so on. We need to see in that framework. Yeah. It is important. For example, like my friend here raised it. Okay, corporation. What is corporation? Even small business is corporate. They are incorporated according to the German company law, or uh, social, uh, finance, uh, let's say company law. Therefore, we frame first, and then we our own framing, and then we associate it with the, with the generally defined, you know, issue or topic. Therefore, we need to see it in several dimensions. This is the only thing I would add. Yes, uh, I, I like to, to, to make an example how you can use the knowledge of a big company in a corporate social responsibility way to change a sector. So, and even if, you, if, if they don't work in their own sector, it takes this example with SIP. I like some, so, and you have made this example with small farmers. So small farmers very often are belongs on the distributors. And the distributors can make the prices because the small farmers don't have the information about the prices in the world. So, so the distributors go from one farm to the next farm and they buy the wheat or whatever, in this case it's cash units, to a very, very low price. Because the farmers don't know what is the world price. What is the real price? The farmers don't know this. And now SRP is a technology part, develop with a social entrepreneur together, an app, a very, very simple app. In this simple app, the farmer get a smartphone with an app, and now the farmer will know exactly what is the price. And now he gets the fair price on the market, he gets the market price, and the distributor hasn't the chance to exploit this farmer. So that's a very, in this case, you change a sector. It's a very, very small, so you use the the know-how of a corporate partner in a sector who usually this corporate partner is not involved, you use this know-how to change a whole sector. That's what I mean, and you can work together with corporate partners uh, in a specific way if you really identify the specific knowledge, know-how and interests of these corporate partners, then you can take this power, this engagement to change sectors. I think it's it's 5:30 now. Is it? I, all right, a couple more, but uh, it's Friday afternoon, so I'm uh, <laughs> also ready to call it call it a week. Uh, but we have one more question. You've been waiting patiently. Let's take the last question. I think the role of the corporate uh, is to develop the economy in the uh, their country uh, to uh, to improve we uh, welfare the countries. Maybe I, I look uh, at it from a different perception. Uh, uh, corporate should be transparent in uh, giving information about the where can the capital and be directed. They should not involve in money laundering. They should not involve in illicit financial flows. Uh, this is uh, the role of the companies or corporate. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's true. But we have, we have, I think, everywhere in the world the same problem that we have goods which have prices and we have goods without prices. It means the corporates take water, air, uh, bottom, everything for free, mostly for free, because we have not price for air and water. 
Puma, you know Puma is a big international company, made a, two years ago they made a balance sheet about the costs of ecology of their produce, production. And the cost of the ecology was 380 million euros. So that was the cost of ecology. Who carries this cost? The society. That's, we have to pay for it because it's not a part of their balance because they get everything for free. But the costs, we have to carry it. The 380 million. So we have all these companies who use air, water, and all this stuff for free because we have not a price on it. I think we should wrap up. It's been a long day, a uh, long week for many of us. Um, but I would just like to thank the other panelists it was, uh, and, and the participants for your questions. Um, and let's hear one round of applause, please. Thank you.